Some of us are awake. We wonder when the others will wake up, but we're afraid to wake them because you don't want to wake people before it's time. The worst thing you can do is wake someone up before it's time. They are irritable. They don't want to hear nothing about what you have to say. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to let them sleep and wait until they wake themselves up. But the reality of it is this. As our brother Shabazz has said, we are a bit tired of the things that we're seeing. <clears throat> Being in the educational system and looking at what's happening in our classrooms, understanding what could occur in the classrooms, if some of us just had the courage to tell our children the truth. It is not easy. It's not easy when you're in a staff development session, as I do every day. I do staff development every day. I was in two different schools today doing staff development. And as I confront the teachers, many of them not looking like us, if you can imagine the heat that must go on in that room, and please know, I don't really curtail what I have to say. Whether they are all of African descent or all of European descent, the message is the same. You'd be surprised, well you wouldn't be surprised, but some of the things that occur in that room, if some of us as parents were in the room looking at what teaches our children, not who, what, because I'm still trying to figure out if it's animal or plant. I still haven't figured that out yet. I honestly and truly believe that the, the, way, the way in which I see them treat children and us, I honestly and truly believe that in Europe they never became homo sapiens sapien, that they remain on the Neanderthal level. If you study the life of the Neanderthal and if you study the way in which the European has created civilization, there's very little difference except they're sophisticated cavemen. That's the difference. They know how to hit the woman on the head and drag her in the cave in a most sophisticated way. They know how to be an aggressor. I mean, just totally aggressor, aggressor for no reason. Not even animals do that. Even the mighty lion or any of the other animals, the devastating animals, will only kill for hunger, will only kill out of fear, but will never kill for the sake of killing. It goes against the animal kingdom. Now, you may have a, a, an exception to the rule, but there are exceptions in all rules. But the reality of it is, is that what we're facing and what we've got to do is very serious. And what we've got to do is come together. And one thing that I often tell people, don't get caught up in numbers. It's not about numbers. I'd rather have 12 strong than 1,200 weak. So you have power. And you can generate the power. It's not about really the numbers, because if you look at some of the nations that are so powerful, they're not great in numbers. I mean, if you look at Europe, Europe wasn't great in numbers. They just had something that they could put together to put onto the world. But numbers, it's, your, it's the concentrated effort of the group that makes a difference. And it's important that we realize this. It's a process. I often tell people, instead of having a membership drive, Drive to make the needs of your group be met. Because if as a 12 people group, you began to meet the needs of whatever it might be that each needed, of oh, that is what's going to attract your membership. Membership is not going to be attracted just to a group. It's going to be attracted to success. And if in your 12 or your 13 or however many come, if you are solid in your belief, and if you support each other, the community will automatically come together. Because the times that are ahead, please know, today is election day, 1993. Let me tell you something, it don't make a difference who wins. It's the same game. So don't think because one person going to get it, times are better. Times are determined by the atmosphere of America. And the only way you can judge democracy in America is by the way in which people of color are treated. That's your measuring stick for democracy. And if you can't use that as your measuring stick, you'll never know where we are in terms of democracy. With that, I'd like to at least begin to talk about today's program. And what has been very interesting, the times that I've been working is that I have attempted to, each time I meet you, I don't like to repeat, I don't like to go over the same thing. I like to give you some new information. This summer, I did a lot of study and a lot of research on the concept of consciousness. And in looking at consciousness in terms of the psychological and the philosophical ramifications of what it is that we're talking about, what we have come to realize is that folk of African descent are conscious, but they are not conscious that they're conscious. They are conscious, but they're not conscious that they're conscious. So they can bring forward 
rap, but never consciously link it up to their African ancestry. Our young people could invent breakdance, but never hook it up to capoeira to see the relationship. They have hip hop, but can't see the bebop. All of this, our young people, even our generations and the elder generation. I remember my father used to always tell me, let the young people do their thing. I remember he used to say, well, they used to get on us about our thing. It just happens to be one against the other when it comes to generations. But the reality is that our young people have not created something new. What they've done is extended what we have already done. And while they're conscious of what they're doing, they are not conscious. You see, there are people who have problems with our brother Luke. Luke Campbell, I think that's his name. There are people who have problems with rap. But that's unfair. I don't like what I hear either. But I don't like to see it. And what our rappers are talking about is what's happening in our communities. Whether we like it or not, put aside what you like or not. It's a newscast. Rap is a newscast telling you what's happening. Music is a newscast telling you what's happening. But what's so powerful is the African ingredient that goes into rap. Because you see, the whole thing with iced tea, you know, think about it. I mean, that was just ridiculous. You know, like they were citing Arnold Schwarzenegger and Rocky. I mean, how many people has Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger have killed police right down and left on TV? Forget the song. The visual is there, killing police. But no one's accusing Arnold Schwarzenegger of starting a revolution. But when Ice-T does that, young people of European descent hear this. And that creates a great problem when they go home to be in the same house with the parents they hear Ice-T talking about. And so that's why the problem with Ice-T occurs. But I mean, in terms of accusing him of starting it, that's nonsense. Because every day we see movies about police. Oh, local RoboCop. <laughs> it's right here. All of this is here. So, I mean, it's really hypocritical to even deal with the issues. But the power that we have as black people, we have to understand. We have to understand. When I look out sometimes and I talk to some of the teachers and I see their faces, you know, when I present concepts like, you know, to have a picture of George Washington in the main office in the school is like having a picture of Adolf Hitler in Yeshiva University. Think of the concept. They don't want to deal with it. Because no one should have a right as black. This has nothing to do with faith systems. This has to do with people of color against people of non-color. Nobody thinks twice about having George Washington on their wall in the main office of schools. He owned over 400 African folk. He imprisoned them and held them against their will. And he even traded them for liquor. Because we've seen different types of, of trading agreements where he traded liquor for African people. Now, we as African people are supposed to consciously say we respect him? Well, we have to be crazy. That's why they treat us that way. Because if you're going to look at that man who imprisoned over 400 of us, how many, and how many Europeans you know with the last name Washington? Black folk named Washington. He, they, he's a forefather, all right. But he's not the kind of forefather they're talking about. The reality of it is, is that he had over 400 African folk, and his picture is plastered in every main office in our schools. And it's not a school I go into that I don't complain about. It's not a school I go into that I don't explain how I feel about him. And when they jump on the African piece, I say, as a Native American, I also have problems with what I'm looking at. And if you have that picture up there, you have to understand how I feel when I see it. And I simply ask, do I have a right to raise that point? Now, either they have to say yes or they say no. And most of the time, they say, I do have a right. So they have to deal with the issue. Whether or not they take the picture down is another story. I did get them to take him down in a couple of schools. I'm working on Abraham Lincoln now. I don't want to push my luck. I got George out, now I'm working on Abraham. But these are the types of things that we're faced with as people. And think about it, we're supposed to be happy. We're supposed to take off Washington's birthday. And I ask you, would you ask a child of Jewish faith to take off Hitler's birthday? Just think about it. You know, I'm not saying one way or another. Just think about the concept. And if you can deal with the concept, then you can understand how we feel. So that when we say never again, what exactly do we mean never again? Never again to me or never again to anybody? Because I think it's about never again to me. What I'd like to talk to you about this evening <clears throat> is going to tie into some of the classes that we had. My brother Yusuf, may I move around? Take it out. In fact, can I move this over? Yeah. Because I'm going to probably be talking from here for a while. You can either while. use your hand or, take, or move it over. Okay. 
what I would like to do is talk to you about Atum. Because one of the things that we're facing as a people is that we're really focusing on what they call ethnic cheerleading. We're under the impression that what we want to do is sit in classrooms and to discuss history and social studies. Nothing wrong with that. But African history is a way of thinking, it's a way of living, it's in mathematics, it's in science, biology. To the ancient Chemites, science was knowledge. Science to, to us today is pigeonholed biology, chemistry, astronomy, astrology, things like that. But the way in which the Chemites defined science was all knowledge, and a patron of science was Tehuti. And what the ancients said in the Memphite text was that in the very beginnings of the universe, before everything and all existed, the cosmos or the universe was in unicity. In other words, everything was one. And they were one in the waters of Nun. Now before we go on, I would like to show you a picture that's in Kemet, and I think that you will also remember this picture. Please excuse my drawing. Have you seen this before? Have you just, but you cannot, you, you can be in a state where you are not conscious that you're conscious. Western civilization is not conscious, but thinks they're conscious. We are following in their steps because we are not looking at the world through what is known as metaphoric measurement. Now, this is heavy stuff. I'm telling you, as I get deeper into our ancestors, I can't, I mean, a lot of answers in my life come to be when I study deeper and deeper. This summer, I came upon this. Let's get back to APEP for a minute so you can understand. As you can see, there is a relationship here. Let me ask you this. Do we have any electricians in the room? Okay, maybe we have some people in science that can deal with this. Have you ever seen this before? That is a wave and oscillation. That's electromagnetism. And that's what the Chemites said none was, electromagnetism. Let's take it a step further. There is also a story in Kemet where Setesh slays Apep. And he slays Apep by drawing a sphere, a spear, through Apep. Okay? That's a story of Setesh slaying the evil snake Apep. Taking his place, by the way, and becoming Cain, he ingested the evil by murdering it, so Setesh himself becomes evil. In slaying, but it's not a story about a man becoming evil, Let me ask you this. Let's look at this. This is an oscillating wave. In electricity, what we do is that we call this amplitude. We want to measure amplitude. The way in which we measure amplitude, these are the hilltops are called crests, and the valleys are called troughs. This is all science, my brothers and sisters. I have not done any ethnic cheerleading yet. These are called crests, these are called trolls. You measure the ability of electricity by the relationships of one crest to another. Say it again, brother. That's right. I'm on the right track. Please understand something. I learned this this summer. I was not into this this summer. I learned it this summer. Why did I learn it? Because I saw it through my eyes. I have a right to look at this information through African eyes. I don't have to sit in the classroom and listen to Europeans tell me about Fror. I forget how you spell his name. A European who went on a trip with a man named Napoleon. Let me tell you something else. Napoleon took, see this is something people don't talk about. You need to know this. Europe had no concept of electricity and magnetism prior to Napoleon's trip to Kemet. There's no story. Some of the Jesuit priests were doing some things with Amaris because you can get static electricity with this particular gem, but you can't really do too much with it. No electricity. Napoleon took approximately, I don't want to say how many exactly, but a hundred and something in the high 100s. Took him over to Kemet in 1798. With him, he had a man, he had two particular people. I'd like to, well, three if you want to count Count Volney. Another one he had was a man named Volta. 
where the vault is named after, so-called been given credit for the battery even. He had no concept of what he was doing before he went to Egypt. All of a sudden he comes back and he invents electricity. This is what he saw on the walls of Kemet. And between Champollion's decipherment of Medonetcha order, the best that they could do it, and his being able to look at this, another gentleman sat down by the name of Frior. I could have his name wrong. Frior, and this is what Frior is known for. Europe had no concept of the sine wave prior to going to Kemet. Coming back, all of a sudden, Europe has an explosion of information. And what happens? Britain goes to war with France because France has a monopoly on science. So when you're talking, when you're looking at Wellington and Napoleon and all, they're fighting over African knowledge because France now has a, a monopoly on electricity and magnetism. Now here come Ben Franklin. You got Ben Franklin. The man didn't invent a thing. He was, in, he was the official printer for the, uh, he was the official printer for Pennsylvania. He had a strong relationship with Native Americans. And he began to study what Native Americans were doing in America. And because he was in the patent office, and because he knew Native Americans, he was then made the commissioner for Indian Affairs. Did you know that about Ben Franklin? In the year 1744, a Native American from the Iroquois Nation by the name of Ganastego. Ganastego. He went to an American-British meeting and he told them, he said, listen, when Native Americans, when my people make deals, see, because the Iroquois was, was a united five nation, Cayuga, Mohawk, Onondago, Oneida, and Iroquois. Five nations. The Tuscarora came after. But they were five nations unified. The Northeast was unified. Don't let them tell you they were dealing with primitive people. The Native Americans had an entire system, because I'm going to tell you something else about Native Americans along the Mississippi River. Ganastego in 1744 met before this committee and told the British and the Americans, when we make deals with you, Pennsylvania don't know what New York is doing, New York don't know what George is doing, yet we know what everybody's doing because we're unified. What's wrong with you people? Get yourself together. Ben Franklin and Washington told them, but we come from a land of monarchs. We have never known democracy before. We've never been together. The 13 colonies were sovereign and independent states. And what happened was each had, this is where sovereign statehood comes from even now. They had the ability, these states had the, and the, the Ben Franklin and the so-called forefathers were saying, but how can you take 13 independent units and unite them? And he said, through morality. Now you know where that goes, but that's a story for, I have to come back and talk to you about that. Ben Franklin said, I think this is a good idea. Ben Franklin began to encourage the European colonialists to follow the Iroquois. 1754, Ben Franklin himself faces Albany and tells all of them, we must take on the Iroquois Confederation unless we want to destroy ourselves. Of course, it took another 20 years before they finally adapted it. But the entire constitution was written. Native Americans had something known as sachems. Sachems. These sachems were like representatives or senators. There were 50 of them. 50 of them. Do we hear that number 50 somewhere? And what's interesting is that no matter how big the nation or no matter how small the nation, they all had the same amount of representatives and they had one vote. That's where the UN came from. The League of Nations followed the Iroquois Confederation because that was the document that was used in order to bring together international independent nations with everyone having power but at the same time having a unity around a council. And it was this grand council that the Sachems elected that would represent them. 
which is like you're small, like you have your education committee, you have your economic committee. That's where that concept came from. The European invented absolutely nothing. In fact, it was a gentleman by the name of Henry Steele Comager, Comager, C-O-M-M-A-G-E-R, who said, yes, the Iroquois invented federalism, but the European signed the document. And that's the difference. That's why we don't know where all of this comes from. This type of information is never taught in the curriculum. Our young people are unaware of what American history truly is. Even to embrace what was going along in the Mississippi River. Let me tell you something about Mississippi. This is where we come in. In St. Louis, Missouri, when the people first came to St. Louis, they called it Mound City. Because St. Louis alone has 26 pyramids. Okay. There's a place in southern Illinois known as Cahokia. Cahokia has the largest pyramid in the world. When you look at the Mississippi River, please check this out. When you go along the Mississippi River, there are over 170 pyramids. And all of these come out of a relationship because, let me draw you the United States. Not the best drawing, but gives you an idea. This is, let's say this is the Mississippi. Mississippi goes right through America and empties into the Gulf of Mexico. In ancient times, the Native, you see, the reason why we don't know the Native American is because we always focus on the 13 colonies. By the time we get out west, we so caught up on, uh, on westward expansion and the European that we never look at the civilization along the Mississippi River. Along the Mississippi River, there is evidence that this was the center of Native American world. That this is, the, um, these, these, this is the crossroads of America where here the three major languages of the Native American were spoken. The Muskegon, Sioux, Iroquois. There's evidence of that. Chapter 2, there's a book out, Native Roots, Jack Weatherford, Chapter 2, Pyramids Along the Mississippi. <clears throat> What's important about this is because African people had the ability and the knowledge to know grid squares, to be able to work along with the Native American now, because this is another thing that we have to be very strong on. Native Americans were some of the finest pharmacologists and agriculturalists in the world. They knew the land and the soil like they knew themselves. African people knew the land and the soil of Africa. When they came here, they commingled, came together, and they developed. That is why the Native American is called the Red Man. Because the Native American is, in fact, a combination of the yellow Asian and the African. And that's why they're red. If you look at the complexions of them, they're about my complexion. Brother Man here, they're brown. They're not, they're not, they're not um, light complexion. They're very dark. In some places in Mexico, they're very dark. When you get down into Mexico, they're black. It's amazing what the world is, and unless you get out there, we don't really know what's happening. Let's get back to here. Not only was it a major language center, it was also a trading center where we find evidence of Native Americans in Mexico, Native Americans in Saskatchewan and Alberta in Canada, California, and the Iroquois. But not just that. We find evidence of Native Americans in Africa. It's just not about Africans coming to America. We can't focus on that. It's a lively trade occurring in the ancient world. You've got to see this. I mean, real issues are being traded. They're trading real things and building civilizations. There's a difference, though. There's no concept of saving. Because it's not that they did not have the ability to think of saving. Is that there was nothing to save. See, we get this thing about the refrigerator. The, refri the refrigerator comes directly out of Western mentality. You'll never find a refrigerator in Africa. Because there's no need to refrigerate food. Because food is there all the time. You see? So you don't have to mentally worry about what's going to bring tomorrow. Because tomorrow is going to be like today. Unless, of course, there's a famine. And that's why you have ceremonies. To ensure the best for the community. Kwanzaa. 
Native Americans, Asians, all had these types of ceremonies coming out of the African mindset. When we break it down on this level and we understand, I mean, we're talking about major civilizations that are doing mighty trading on boats, trading, developing civilizations long before the European even knew how to get on the water. Now, is it important? No, that's not the important piece. The important piece is for us to understand what yesterday looked like. Because conscious speaking, we cannot fathom us making decisions on our own. We still see us going to someone else to ask permission. And until we consciously understand that there was a time when they came to us on their knees, not because they were begging, but because they were so sick, they came to America and asked the Native American for help. Say, I'm hungry, Native American fed him. I'm cold, don't have no clothes, Native American put clothes on his back. Don't have no house, I'll give you a house. But the Native American and the African did more than that. They taught the European how to till the soil. They taught the European how to make clothes. They taught the European how to build a house. So, you know, there's a proverb that said, you give someone a fish to eat for a day. You teach them how to fish to eat for a lifetime. The Native American and the African was of such a mentality that there was no immediate threat. They saw the European as their brother and sister and was willing to extend to them a friendship. And today we are living examples of what turned out of that friendship and people have the nerve to ask us, what's wrong? You got a chip on your shoulder. When are you going to let all that go past you? That's the past. That's not the past. That's very much the living future. Because as long as we are unconscious of what we actually were doing during ancient times, our young people will never be able to do the things that we need them to do. If you cannot visualize, you cannot actualize. If you cannot see yourself doing something, you cannot do it. You must be able to see yourself. That's why when a young brother or sister say, I want to be a lawyer, one of the first things I begin to work on that young people, can you see yourself defending your client. Can, look at yourself. Close your eyes, brother. Close your eyes, sister. Look at yourself teaching somebody mathematics. Can you see yourself? I don't stop until they say yes. Even if I have to get them up to make it actually go through the motions itself, that helps them perceive the ability to do it. They must see it. So with that, I'd like to take you... Uh -oh. Is there any... What I'd like to do is I'd like to break down consciousness in certain ways so you can understand. Remember, this is Nun. There are four intellectual stages in consciousness. Four. If I may abbreviate, INT is intellectual development. The first step is percept. A percept is a sense. For instance, you see a tree, smell a tree, touch a tree, taste a tree. That's the first thing that occurs. When you get enough percepts in your mind, the complex percepts become one recept. And that recept becomes the image that you see when you put together your percepts. Let's take it through. You see a tree, you create the image of seeing a tree. You smell a tree, you create the image of the smell. The image is a con concretization of the abstraction. So, I mean, you can't literally smell a tree, but you can concretize the smell of a tree when you walk around and say, it smells like a forest. Have you ever been around, it smells like, it smells like wood? Well, that's a, an image concretizing an abstract idea. And you can touch a tree. Now, you begin to get these recepts or images together. Let me just write this. Sense perception and image. The complex recepts become a concept. It is this concept that brings us into being. And this is what's very important, the concept. Complex concepts become intuition. 
A good example of intuition is to ask some of us in here to explain to me how you walk. We've been walking so much, and it's become such a second nature for those of us who can walk freely. I'm not speaking of those who are challenged. Those of us who walk without impediment, walk intuitively. Something occurs, you just automatically get up and start walking or something. But, I mean, you could not stop to explain to me step by step what occurred to make you get up and start walking. You could, but intuitively it's something, I just did it by instinct. That's what animals have, but animals have it on a, we have it on a higher level. But now, concept is, the, uh, is a concept, or an abstract idea, and then, or I, I should say idea. And then the intuition is what we call instinctive free will. What our ancestors down south call mother wit. Now, along with inter, uh, intellectual development, intellectual development leads towards consciousness. Grades of consciousness, and there are four grades of consciousness. When you are in a world where you're only perceptual, you're only picking up your sense perceptions, that level is the level of unconscious. Plants are on that level. They only act through their sense perceptions. If you, that's why when you are in a coma, they say you're in a vegetable state. You are unconscious. It is not that you're not conscious, you're unconscious. There's a difference. See, folk of color in our communities who are outside there instead of here are not conscious. They're not unconscious. They're not conscious. If they was laying up in a coma, they'd be unconscious on the corner of West Burnside. Now they are not conscious on the corner of West Burnside. There's a difference. When you are living in a world where you're only perceptual or receptual, you then get into what is known as simple consciousness. And if I may abbreviate consciousness, C-O-N-S. That's the level of the animal. The animal is on. A dog will come by, a dog has sense perception, and a dog also know go around the microphone pole. They, can't con they cannot conceptualize that. Because conceptualization is what is the breakthrough that our ancestors went through to become self-conscious. At the moment that you conceptualize your world, <clears throat> you become self-conscious, you automatically receive something. <clears throat> it is the language in order to convey that self-consciousness. I'm not talking about not having the physical ability to speak. I'm talking about having the mental ability to be able to convey what you are thinking. That is self-conscious. On April 3rd, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King stood before a group in Memphis. It was at that that I'd like to demonstrate cosmic consciousness, which is what happens at your instinctive level of free will. This is what the ancient Chemites talked of when they said the sons of light. Not the S-O-N, S-U-N of light. When you reach the cosmic consciousness, when you are instinctively will-free, when the world and life that you live, you live through ancestral guidance. In Star Wars, they said, let the force be with you. Mm -hmm. That's what cosmic consciousness is. Is when you walk the earth with an ancestral mission, you have seen people like that. Alton Maddox is on his way to cosmic consciousness. You can tell by his action and his reaction, he's aiming at something. He may not be able to tell us now what he's aiming at, but when he gets there, he can do what Dr. King did. And Dr. King said, I've been to the mountain top. Listen, look at the pictures he's creating for us. I've been to the mountain top. I've been able to look over and see the promise land. If you get into this atomically, if you get into it, whether or not Dr. King was talking about Kemet or Egypt, 
There are things that occur amongst us that become vocal points for things down the road for us to understand. He almost went through the Memphite text in that speech. But you've got to be able to metaphorically change what he said into an African consciousness. I have been to the mountaintop where I have been able and allowed to look over. And I've seen the promised land. And he said, I may not get there with you. And he spoke about long life is wonderful. But I'm not worried about that now. One of the first signs of having a cosmic experience is when you lose the fear of death. You see, there's a movie out now. I forget what it's called. It's about a man that had a near occasion of death. And he goes through a rampage. But do you see what he does? He dare. He walks on ridges of roofs. He challenges life because he has no fear of death. And, of course, you know the European is going to be the cosmic conscious one. But let's put that aside. And let's deal with what Dr. King told us so that you can at least understand what a cosmic experience is. So that when he said that, he said, I may not get there with you, but long life don't mean a thing anymore. But he wanted us to know that night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So that is why I tell us we have a long road ahead. We have a lot of work ahead. But with what Dr. King told us alone, and you see a lot of people into this I have a dream speech because they want to keep him a dreamer. Uh -huh. But that speech in Memphis, get a copy of it and look at it metaphorically. Look at the play on words that he has. Whether or not he's absolutely conscious of what he's saying or not is not the point. Because that's another thing that occurs. You lose control over what you say and you become an instrument of the ancestral guidance. And you begin to say things that even you start saying, wow, what did I say that for? But these are the things that occur in cosmic consciousness. When you are able to get to the point of intuitive free will, when you have freed yourself of the earthly fetters of this nonsense that they teach us. I mean, this is a bunch of nonsense that they teach us, you know. The whole reason why we're in school has no concern as to why we were in school in Africa. There is no reason. There are four irreducible concepts of life. And when we're in that classroom, this is what all education is about. Education is about learning existence, logic harmony and measurement everything we teach in school is about whether it's math, science, social studies, whatever it is it can be reduced to one of these four irreducible concepts so when we're in that classroom we're not teaching our children to get a good job. That was never the purpose of education in Africa. It was to liberate your mind from the material fetters that kept it down so that you could spiritualize and become a son of light and not a S-O-N. The European changed that word around. It was the S-U-N. It was the ramification or the manifestation of the sun on earth, who we are. Black dots, all of us. Black dots walking the earth. We are capsulated pieces of the sun. The energy of the sun is encapsulated and we are walking on earth. And that's what the ancients meant when they said we are children of the sun. They saw themselves as pieces of the sun, but more importantly, there is a physical sun, but there is a spiritual sun, which is light and heat energy, which, by the way, is the carbon atom. Because as we, we've said before, you put four hydrogen atoms together. This is the this is how you would depict hydrogen, just a capital H. All of the elements and atoms have a capital H. There are 109. Uh, quite a few of them are created by Western civilization. Africans said, if it's not on Earth when we got here, it don't belong on Earth now. Because the master would have put it here, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we should not eat anything that was not here on Earth when we got here. It's one of the reasons. You put four H together, you get one H E. But you don't. You get one HE plus light and heat, if I may do it this way, light and heat energy. Light and heat energy. Let me say it again. The sun 
The whole thing that the sun does is called nuclear fusion. The sun is about bringing together hydrogen atoms constantly to create helium. That's the job of the sun. That's all they do. The process by which the sun does it is by fusing the nucleuses of four hydrogen atoms. Fictitiously, each atom has a weight. It's called the atomic mass unit, the AMU. It's a fictitious measurement, but it's, it's able to decipher and separate one thing from another. They give hydrogen as the lightest al uh, atom. They give hydrogen, let's say, I've seen it 1.0081, 1.0018. Let's, let's give it a fictitious number so it don't make a difference. Let's say it's 1.25. <clears throat> <clears throat> if you put four hydrogen atoms together, you would think that four times 1.25 would be what one helium atom weighs. But it doesn't. A helium atom weighs slightly less than four because in the process of fusing, the, high, the helium atom loses weight. You know how when we do exercise and we're really, and we begin to sweat and that heat starts coming off of us, we start to lose weight. Well, that's the same thing that the sun is doing. The sun is fusing, it's like it's exercising constantly to create helium, but in so doing, it loses weight. But in losing weight, nothing ever loses in the universe. What it does is that it makes itself into light and heat energy, which comes down to the earth. And coming down to the earth, it further through thermonuclear reaction, becomes carbon. And carbon created life on earth. And because of the nature of carbon, life had to come from black. Just like you're not going to see any plant other than green. If you take that plant and take it up to Europe, it's going to become an albino plant. It's going to become white. And they're called albino plants. They're faded plants. You take a cockroach. I see white cockroaches. You ever seen a white cockroach? You know what it's called? Albino cockroach. It's not a matter of superiority, inferiority here. We're talking. We're just talking biological fact. So this coming down to the earth creates the energy or the carbon that creates life. Okay. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to continue